Welcome to the MOOC Tailored Materials and Endnotes for Industrial Processes. My name is Robert Kurist, and this is the fifth unit of the basic module and deals with directed enzyme evolution. So the previous unit, I explained that the catalytic properties of enzymes are installed in the primary sequences. And we want to improve if we use directional protein design or uh, directed evolution in order to improve these pr properties for applications. And in rational protein design, we can bring in uh, mutations at uh, select sites that, for instance, we identified based on structure elucidation or by molecular modeling. And then we predict that the effect of a certain amino acid exchange, we incorporate this mutation, enter, alter the structure, and then alter the function. The problem is that it is exceedingly difficult to, to make it accurate prediction of a change of an amino acid sequence, but in some cases, and I explained one in the last unit, this works reasonably well. So um, so the case was the one of the Ahul manulite decarboxylase, which produces optical pure um, alpha-substituted carboxylic acids. And um, in this case, so the, the enzyme dec decarboxylates malonates, it cleaves carbon dioxide, and in the wild type, uh, the wild type produces the iron enzymer by protonation from one side. And exchange of this cysteine to a serine, which does not protonate anymore, and the introduction of the cysteine at the opposite side of the active site completely inverted the enantiomer selectivity. This is a classical case of rational um, design because a rational prediction was introduced, was, 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 was investigated in an experiment, and could be confirmed. Unfortunately, the activity of the resulting mutant was uh, here G74C C188S was by 18,000 um, was 18,000 fold reduced. So somehow this cysteine, or maybe the serine, or maybe both, they interfered with activity. And at this stage, the researchers had no clue how they could recover the activity of this of uh, of this mutant, and therefore they. Um, went for directed evolution. In rational protein design, we only need to introduce very few mutations. And this can be done in a very controlled way. It's very simple. In directed evolution, the generation of the mut mutants means it influences what kind of amino acids we can access and how they're distributed. So this is a crucial element of the experiment. And there are basically two approaches. One is purchase chemically synthesized libraries. The other is do it yourself in the lab. Chemical synthesis is very expensive, costs several thousand of euros, but of course, it's not work intensive. And um, mutagenesis in the lab can be done with very simple ingredients, but it needs a skilled co-worker. So there's personal cost, and then the decision is just a question of priorities. However, also um, chemically synthesized libraries and um, uh, PCR generator libraries are a bit different. So it's not ex exactly the same. So it's a mixture of priorities and also what kind of libraries we want to have. In mutagenesis, uh, we have PCR-based methods and we have other methods. And for the sake of simplicity, I will focus here on polymerase chain reaction-based mutagenesis because this is now the most frequently used method. There are others, there are chemical reagents that induce mutations, and we don't like to work with them because they're cancerogenic. Or there's UV mutagenesis, could be also used. And there are mutator strains that are deficient of repair systems, so that each cell doubling, they would, in, they would cause a certain number of mutations. Also a bit difficult to control. So I would think, I, I, I think polymerase chain reaction is the most frequently used method right now to generate libraries for direct evolution. Aeroprom PCR was one of the very first uh, methods used for mutagenesis for direct evolution. It is quite a simple method and can be done in every lab that has the ingredients and machines for a regular PCR. So in the regular PCR, um, a double-stranded DNA is our template. Then there are specific primers that bind, and the polymerase amplifies the two strands. And then the product of the PCR serves as 
te template for the next cycle. So the product of the first cycle is also the template of the next. So every step in every cycle, the concentration of the DNA doubles. And uh, because of this, this is called a chain reaction. So the um, polymerase has a very high accuracy. So uh, it has an error rate of one in 100,000 or one in a million. And then polymerases have usually a second unit attached to them, which slide along the DNA and check the double strand for errors. And this also has an error rate of one in a thousand. So this gives us totally an, an error rate in the billions. With this high accuracy, it would be difficult to insert mutations. However, there are ways to increase the error rate of a polymerase. And this is done in so-called error-prone PCR. And these are quite easy, uh, quite, uh, quite simple ways. So we can use a polymerase that does not have the proofreading capacity. So this already increases the error rate a lot. And we can add um, manganese instead of magnesium. So both are bivalent ions. And magnesium is in the active side of the polymerase to coordinate the nucleotides. And if there is manganese, somehow the enzyme um, has a higher error rate. We can also spike a nucleotide concentration. This means if we have more, for instance, of DCTP, then the likelihood that DCTP comes into the active site of the enzyme is higher, leading also to a higher error rate. And if we combine all this, um, this can increase the error rate to 1% to 2%. So in this case, we would still have our template, primers bind, and then the amplification causes um, errors, which I have here denoted with these uh, red crosses. And these errors would, of course, be then again in the next cycle as a template. And the polymerase then, if it amplifies, um, um, conserves these mistakes, but also introduces new errors in every cycle. So with the number of cycles and the conditions of this, we can also adjust the uh, mutation frequency. And this is a widely used uh, method. It has some limitations, and usually it is done for the generation of very large libraries between 50,000 and typically 100,000 clones. Sometimes, we have already a concrete idea for an amino acid position, and we want to insert all 20 amino acids into one position. And in the last unit, I presented site and directed autogenesis, where a certain nucleotide exchange is incorporated, is, is, is introduced by, the, by, by a mutagenic primer, which is a primer which has one different nucleotide or several different nucleotides, but still binds because the large part of the primer is still complementary. And for saturation mutagenesis, we can use primers with a so-called N. And N stands for four bases, G, A, T, and C. And uh, so a primer, which is, says it has an N, is actually a mixture of four primers, 25% of each base. And if this is then incorporated in the amplification and the template is degraded, we have now the N in our gene, which means we have a mixture of genes with each 25% of different, a different base. And by using one or several bases with an N, we can, we can put in every of the 64 codons, which means we can put in every amino acid at a certain position, provided, of course, we have a certain idea which of our 200 or 300 positions to saturate. The last component for a direct evolution experiment uh, is the high throughput screen. So here we need a simple way to measure a, a reaction in a microdata plate. And um, the activity of the aim days can be determined by the quantification of substrate and product, for instance, in a high HPLC. Uh, but this would mean for each mutant, we need to make a blast one HPLC measurement, which would be a large number of HPLC measurements already. But in this case, we can, if we, if we, if we decarboxylate and malinate and produce a monoacid, we have a pH shift. The, uh, because here we have two carboxylic groups, here only one, so the medium gets more basic. And then we can use a buffer with a low buffer capacity. And you see this here. In these wells, the reaction took place and the shift to the basic a pH was visualized with the addition of a pH indicator. And, and here, in this way, no reaction took place. Then there was the, the wild-type enzyme was added at certain points to show, to see, for instance, if all these four measurements, uh, or all the six measurements, have the same rate. And then we get a so-called mutant landscape. So 
this would be here inactive variants or lower active variants. This would be here our wild type. You see we have quite a spread. So this assay is not so accurate. And then we might have some where we have a high activity. So with such a screen, we can now efficiently screen thousands of variants, 100 per plate. And there are also micro plates that have 364 walls, walls, which even give us many more clones to screen. So coming back to the experiment, so the um, mutant G74C, C188S, has the cysteine on the other side, is inverse, but has low activity. And the determinants of the activity were unknown. But it is known that the enzyme always cleaves the same carboxylic group, which is this one, which is one pointing out towards us. And this is accommodated in a hydrophobic pocket, which results in unfavorable interactions, and this leads to the cleavage of carbon dioxide. So it was thought that a variation of this hydrophobic pocket might change the activity. And um, these are here residues in this active site. So we have a methionine, we have a valine 156, we have valine 43, we have a tyrosine 48, a leucine 40, and a leucine 77. Here is the catalytic cysteine. This should not be altered, of course. And here we have the serine, which um, was is the cysteine in the wild type. So they, they constitute this hydrophobic pocket. And now, by saturation rhodogenesis, each of these residues was saturated. So first of all, this serine, which is now not anymore needed, was altered, and it was shown that the glycine in this position gives a five times higher activity. And this was then used as a template. And next, here different residues were saturated. And here, for instance, um, if leucine 77 is, uh, is altered, a methionine was the most active variant. And interestingly here, uh, the substitution of methionine 159 by leucine led to a hundredfold, almost hundredfold activity increase. And then when this was used as a template, again, the hit y 48 f led to a 900-fold high activity. So by one to three cycles of mutagenesis, the activity could be increased 900-fold. So this is a typical um, experiment of a random randomization protein engineer. So the uh, the effect is striking. We have a 900-fold activity increase, but it is very difficult to understand why substitution of M959 with a leucine, which is not much bigger, uh, leads to such a striking activity increase. One thing we can see here, uh, we can see here that all the hits, all the improved variants, have hydrophobic amino acids, which makes a lot of sense because all of these amino acids are hydrophobic. So there was no arginine, lysine, serine, or glutamate found. And actually, in hindsight, it is also possible to do this experiment now with a restriction of the amino acids put and putting in only hydrophobic amino acids. So there are a lot of degrees of freedom, but it is also not known if this here is the best variant of the enzyme. But direct evolution brings, produces improved variants without an accurate understanding why here, for instance, these changes of these hydrophobic amino acids lead to this activity increase. This makes it such a power, this makes it such a powerful method. So if we compare the rational design and the randomization, we have several important factors. One factor is how well do we understand our enzyme? If we have a very good hypothesis, we can be a very good prediction, one mutant can be sufficient. And indeed, in the aim date example, um, a double mutant inverted the selectivity completely. If we have very good knowledge, then we need to screen only few. If we have not so much knowledge, if we, if we understand our enzyme rather poorly, then we need a tremendous screening effort. And um, this is then a question of experimental capacities. So um, nowadays, we have a lot of ways to get structures without experimental structure inf uh, information. In many cases, we can make, we have similar enzymes, proteins that have been crystallized. So we can make homology models and we can also make very plausible uh, de novo predictions. And also often we know something about the mechanism, even if it's a very new enzyme. On the other hand, if it's an interesting enzyme, often it's quite new, so we do not have so much experience. So we are often here. We have some knowledge, but not enough knowledge to make accurate predictions.
This is a typical example of the hydrophobic pocket. So the researchers doing this, Miyamoto and Ota, they identified this hydrophobic pocket as activity driver, but they could not pinpoint and uh, predict, uh, predict mutations, so they could use this for randomization. We have a similar situation with the screening effort. It is quite easy to screen a few thousand variants. We can do this with an HPLC, with a pH screen. So this is quite simple. To screen millions or even billions, this would mean we need a selection assay or a fluorescence assay, and they, they are available for only few enzymes. So therefore, the, uh, the quite usual situation is that we have some idea, for instance, we can predict the active site residues, and we have a medium throughput screen, and this means we can screen 100 to 200 variants, or maybe 5,000 variants, and this is now a way how enzyme engineering is done often nowadays. So with this, I uh, introduce you to a few basic concepts of, um, of molecular biotechnology and biocatalysis. So um, the way to produce enzymes and to optimize them by um, bioregional protein design and direct enzyme evolution. And the following, um, the following units will then discuss how enzymes can be improved uh, for the use of multi-cascade reactions by immobilization to carriers. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.